Shall we turn down our Bibles to John the fifth or First Corinthians the fifteenth chapter? I like that fifteenth chapter of John. First Corinthians chapter fifteen. Paul declares, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which you received and wherein you stand. I preached it, you received it, and you're standing in it. Gospel means good news. I preached to you the good news. You received the good news and you're standing in that good news. The gospel by which Paul said we are saved, if we keep in memory what I have preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Now, there in the church of Corinth, there had developed some spurious practices but there had also developed some spurious beliefs. And so Paul is encouraging them to continue in the basic gospel that he had preached. Here in chapter 15, he's going to deal with some of the spurious beliefs that had crept in. Those that were denying the resurrection. So this is why Paul is encouraging them to continue to hold in memory the basic, simple gospel that he preached. It's sad and tragic that people try to make things so complicated, that people get so enthralled or enmeshed in semantics and fine little points, that they become so critical of everything that they soon, the only fruit that they bear in their lives is the fruit of criticism, finding fault. And when a person gets to that place where all they can do is find fault, they really have no real value in the body of Christ. Here we find that in the church of Corinth, uh, there were those who had sort of just been carried away with these uh, notions, with these ideas, and, and they were no longer of real value in the body of Christ. So, hold in memory or keep in memory what I've preached unto you, the simple gospel, unless you have believed in vain. Uh, Paul warns about being removed from the simplicity that is in Christ and uh, the vain philosophies and all that people get into, the hair splitting of the theologians. Uh, what a sterilizing kind of a thing. What happens is a person no longer bears fruit. Uh, it's easy to get caught up in uh, sterilizing kind of issues where you're still a Christian, you're still a part of the body, but yet you're no longer fruitful. You bear no fruit, or if it is fruit, it's bad fruit, the fruit of criticism, because criticism begets criticism, and it begets and engenders strife within the body. It begins to create a fighting and bickering within the body of Christ. For I delivered unto you, first of all, and this is the gospel now that Paul is referring to. This is the gospel that you're to continue in. First of all, that which I received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. As Peter is preaching on the day of Pentecost, as he brings up the subject of the crucifixion of Jesus, he 
declares that it was according to the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God that Jesus was crucified and slain. It's uh, something that God had planned in advance. He died for our sins according to the scriptures. Isaiah 53 all of we like sheep have gone astray. We turned every one of us to our own ways. God laid on him the iniquity of us all. That is, he died for our sins. There in 53, for the transgression of my people was he smitten. And so Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried according to the scriptures. Also there in uh, Isaiah 53 made his grave with the rich, buried. But he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now, it is difficult to find any direct passage in the Old Testament that declared he would rise the third day. You have to go into what are known as the types in the Old Testament, which were the shadows of things to come. And uh, the story of God saying to Abraham, take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, and offer him as a sacrifice on a mount that I will show you. And how Abraham journeyed with Isaac for three days until they came to Mount Moriah. And there they left the servants at the base of the mountain as the two of them went up the mountain together. And then Isaac said, Dad, we've got the wood, we've got the fire, but we don't have the sacrifice. And Abraham answered, Son, God will provide himself a sacrifice. And how that Abraham bound Isaac, placed him on the altar, and then God spake and said, Abraham, that's enough. Behold, a ram is caught by its horns in the thicket. And Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah-Jireh, and he prophesied, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. So as in the mind of Abraham, his son Isaac was dead for three days, Abraham, a type of God, thy son, thine only son. Abraham's prophecy, God will provide himself a sacrifice in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen, future. So Jesus there on Mount Moriah, 2,000 years later, God gave his only begotten son as a sacrifice for our sins. But that three days, uh, probably in the types and shadows, is where he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Then he was seen by Peter on the morning of the resurrection at some time. The gospels don't tell us just when. Jesus manifested himself to Peter. Then of the twelve. And after that, he was seen by more than 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. So the appearances of Jesus after his resurrection, uh, then of the 12 and then by more than 500. And after that, he was seen of James, then of all of the apostles, and last of all, he was seen by me also as one that was born out of due time. Uh, Paul, uh, talking about born out of due time, that is, he wasn't really born into the kingdom with the others. He wasn't an immediate disciple of Christ, but Jesus appeared to him there on the road to, uh, to Damascus, and Paul saw the risen Christ. So Paul bears witness of having seen the risen Christ. Paul said, I am the least of the apostles, and I'm not really worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, 
I am what I am. Hey, I love that. I'm not worthy. I'm not deserving uh, to be what I am. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Were it not for the grace of God, who knows what I would be. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Jesus said, they that are forgiven much, love much. Paul persecuted the church. He wasted the church. He forced people to blaspheme the name of Jesus. When Paul met Jesus, his past persecution of the church weighed heavily upon him. To think that he could have been an enemy of Christ, and, and that bothered him, it troubled him. He said, really, I'm not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church. He speaks of himself as being the chiefest of sinners, but yet having experienced the grace of God and having been forgiven much, Paul loves much, and thus he speaks of his own labors even more abundant than the other apostles. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach. That is, whether I'm telling you about the resurrection or they're telling you about the resurrection, we're preaching the resurrection, and so you believe. The gospel which I preached, which you received, by which you stand. So I preached it, you've believed it. Now, if Christ be preached, that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Now, this is a false teaching that had crept into the church in Corinth. Where it came from, we don't know. Uh, there were some of the early Gnostics, uh, Marcion and others, who uh, denied the resurrection from the dead. Uh, and uh, it, it was a, a teaching that had crept into the early church. Paul declares, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, your, our preaching is vain, your faith also is vain, and we have, are found to be false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if the dead don't rise. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. So uh, the powerful argument that Paul begins to give now uh, against this teaching that there is no resurrection. If there is no resurrection, then Jesus isn't risen. And uh, that means that our preaching is vain, your faith is vain, we are actually false witnesses of God, and uh, because if the dead don't rise, then Christ isn't risen. And uh, thus, our faith is vain, and we are still in our sins. There is no forgiveness, there is no redemption. Then they also, further problem which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. There is no hope for the future. There is no hope of the resurrection. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most to be pitied. If, if our hope were just only in this life, then... Uh, that would be a very pitiful state to be in. But Paul then affirms, but now is Christ risen from the dead, and he's become the first fruits of them that slept. Jesus, the first fruit. Now, Paul is going to, again here in Corinth, in his letter to the Corinthians, contrast the natural man, which is after Adam, and the spiritual man, 
which is after Jesus. The natural man after Adam came first. The spiritual man after Jesus came later. And Adam, by his sin, brought death upon humanity. By one man's sin, all were made sinners. So that by one man's righteousness, all have been made righteous. All of us inherited the sinful nature of Adam. We were born with a sinful nature. We received that from Adam. So in Adam all die because all sinned. But in Christ we are now born again, a new nature, the life of the Spirit. And so we live through Christ Jesus. And so a man today is either after Adam or he is after Christ. Two categories of people. The natural man who is that way by nature, born with his sinful nature, or the new man who is after Jesus Christ, born again by the Spirit of God. So Jesus has become the first fruit of those who rise from the dead. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection from the dead. Jesus the first fruits. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Are you in Adam or are you in Christ? And if any man is in Christ Jesus, he's a new creation. The old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Interesting to me how that so many t people excuse their bad temper and uh, certain characteristics of their old nature uh, to the fact that uh, they are from a particular ethnic group or they have red hair or something like that, you know. And... Uh, they, they uh, try to excuse uh, some of the aspects of the old nature uh, by just the admission. Well, you know, that's just the way I was born. But if any man's in Christ, he's a new creature. And thus, we relate to a new federal head. We don't relate to Adam. I don't say, well, that's my old Adamic nature. That was crucified with Christ. And now a new nature after Christ Jesus. So, every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, and afterward they that are Christ at his coming. The glorious hope that we have of the resurrection, Christ the first fruits, and then they that are Christ at his coming. And then comes the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet, and the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. So, each one in their order, Christ the first fruits of those that reign, or those that are raised from the dead, and he must reign until he has put all things in subjection to Jesus Christ. Now in Hebrews we are told that God put all things in subjection unto him. Uh, he was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, but he uh, is crowned now with glory and honor, all things being made subject unto him. But in Hebrews it says we do not yet see all things in subjection to him. But we see Jesus made a little lower than the angels. Not yet is everything. But he will reign until he has brought all things in subjection. Now Jesus Christ is going to return to the earth with his church to reign over the earth. There will be people who will 
be living on the earth at that time who have survived the great tribulation, who have not taken the mark of the beast or worshipped his image or received his number. And under the ideal conditions that will exist when Jesus reigns during the kingdom, again, those who have lived through will experience longevity of life as they did back in Adam's time. During that thousand-year reign of Christ, there no doubt will be a tremendous population explosion here on the earth under these ideal conditions as righteousness shall reign. Now, the rule of Christ will be enforced righteousness. We will be the enforcers. He will rule as a, uh, with an iron-fisted rule uh, over the earth. Men will be forced to live righteously. And we will see the earth as God intended it, men living together in righteousness. But there will still be rebellion in the heart of some, but the inability to express that rebellion in actions. But during or towards the end of the thousand-year reign of Christ, Satan will be released for a short time and men will rise in rebellion against the reign of Christ. And then shall Satan be put down, Michael and his angels fighting with Satan and his angels, and Satan will be cast into Gehenna. Then will be the great white throne judgment of God and the second resurrection, the resurrection of the unrighteous dead, who will stand before God and then be consigned also to Gehenna. This is the second death. When that is destroyed, then all things will be in subjection unto God. Interesting when you, when you look at sort of the cycle. In the beginning, God, sovereign, ruler, creator, all things were made by him. And God created the angelic beings. But creating them with a self-will, Satan exercised that will against God and created a rebellion against the authority of God. God allowed that rebellion to take place. God created the earth, placed man upon it, and allowed Satan the freedom to exploit the tree that was in the garden. And by one man, Adam, who disobeyed the command of God and ate of that tree, sin entered the world. Now, no longer is there one kingdom in the universe, there are two kingdoms. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of light and life, and the kingdom of Satan, which is a kingdom of death and darkness. When God created Adam, he created him in the kingdom of God. He lived and communed with God, was in fellowship with God. But through his sin and disobedience, his spirit died, and he was alienated from God, and he became a part of Satan's kingdom of death and darkness. Now, having transferred from the kingdom of God, light and life, into the kingdom of Satan, death and darkness, man found that there was no way back into the kingdom of God. And God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son who made the way back into the kingdom of God. And so by one, the one man, sin entered the world, death by sin. But by the second Adam, Jesus Christ, he brought righteousness and through faith in Christ, we who were dead in trespasses and sins have been made righteous through him. So ultimately, though, he will bring all things in subjection and then there will be one kingdom in the universe again, the kingdom of light and life, God's glorious eternal kingdom. And we shall live and reign with him forever and ever, world without end.
Now, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And death and hell will be cast into the lake burning with fire. This is the second death. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted which did put all things under him. And that is God put all things under him. And so it is accepted that God the Father wasn't put under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God might be all and in all. Jesus emptied himself. In, though he was with God and thought it not robbery to be equal with God, he stepped down, he emptied himself in order that he might come as a man to this earth and accomplish the divine purposes of redemption. And so he was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death as he emptied himself and became a servant and obedient even unto death. Wherefore, God has also highly exalted him given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. And God has put all things in subjection unto him. Of course, that the exception, of course, is that he that did put things in subjection was not put in subjection. The Father was not put in subjection to the Son, but the Son willingly to the Father. Now, when this purpose is accomplished, then Jesus will once again take his place in the triune Godhead. And no longer will there be uh, that uh, position of a little lower than the angels, but now returned in the glory. And as he prayed, Father, glorify me with the glory that I have with thee before the world ever was. When God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. And so uh, that's the way the things are going to progress until there is just one God, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, ruling over the universe. All things in subjection then unto him. And God may be all and in all. Now Paul inserts here a very interesting passage that is confusing at best. He makes mention, else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? Um, he's arguing, you know, if there is no resurrection, then, then you know, Christ is uh, not risen and our faith is vain and, and all of this. Um, but uh, he now brings up, else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead if the dead rise not at all? Why are they then baptized for the dead? Now, we don't have anywhere in Scripture where there is any teaching at all of baptism for the dead. We don't have any uh, passage outside of this that even makes mention of the subject. We do know that there are many passages of Scripture that indicate that once a person has died, their eternal destiny is sealed. There is not a Scripture at all that gives even the slightest inkling that a person can be saved after they have died. Now, I cannot be baptized for you. Saturday as we're baptizing, uh, you say, well, I don't want to be baptized. I'll say, well, I'll be baptized for you. I can't just go under and, and, and be baptized for you. That won't do you any good at all. And you may come and say, well, I want to be baptized. And the, the pastor may say, well, have you accepted Jesus Christ? No. 
Well, do you want to accept him? No, but I want to be baptized. Well, you may insist, and he might just, you know, get sort of upset. Oh, you want to be about to drown you, you know, just. Uh, <laughs> but that won't save you if it's not something in your heart. If it isn't a work that God has wrought in your heart, baptism won't save you. The ritual will not save you. The ritual of baptism cannot save. It can only bear witness of what we trust God has done within your heart, but it doesn't save you. In the same token, I cannot believe in Jesus Christ for you. I cannot believe in Jesus Christ for my own children. Each man must believe for himself. Salvation is a very individual thing. And each man must believe for himself. Thus, to be baptized for someone else, baptized by proxy, just doesn't work. Much more baptizing for those that are dead. Now, the only group that I know that practices that is the Mormon church. And uh, this is why genealogies are so important to them. Because they take this one passage of Scripture, though this same passage of Scripture flies in the face of the revealed Word of God, yet they go and they are baptized by proxy for their dead relatives, hoping that somehow by their baptism for their dead relatives, that uh, it's going to uh, save them. Just what Paul is referring to here, there have been suggestions made, and none of them are completely satisfactory. It is an enigma. It's a scripture that poses some real questions. Obviously, they were in Corinth baptizing for the dead. But that probably shouldn't surprise us because Corinth was doing a lot of weird things. And the whole letter to the Corinthians was really designed to correct a lot of the false doctrine and a lot of the false practices. So we can assume that they were baptizing for the dead, but without affirming that this was a valid practice, Paul just acknowledges it as a practice in the church in Corinth and shows that you're teaching or you're believing there is no resurrection for the dead, and yet you're dumb enough to baptize for the dead. It doesn't make sense. You know, your practice isn't even in keeping with what you are teaching that there is no resurrection of the dead. If there is no resurrection of the dead, Paul said, why do we stand in jeopardy every hour? Why do we jeopardize our lives? Why do we put our lives on the line for the gospel if there is no resurrection? Why, sh why should I, uh, you know, face the uh, beatings and the uh, imprisonments and all of the persecution if there is no resurrection. I protest, he said, by your rejoicing which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord because I die daily. I'm facing death every day. And if after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what does it advantage me? Now whether or not Paul actually was fighting with the beast or he's referring to the beastly men in Ephesus, we don't know. But what does it advantage me if the dead don't rise? Let us eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. In other words, why not just live it up? Let's party. If, if there is no resurrection, uh, then there is no incentive for righteous living. There's no incentive for sacrificial living. There's no incentive for giving ourselves fully for God if there is no resurrection. Be not deceived. 
these evil communications, that is, there is no resurrection, corrupt good manners. They, they lead to immoral living. Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God, and I speak this to your shame. So dealing with this false teaching in Corinth that there is no resurrection. But some men will say, now Paul affirms that there is a resurrection, so some will then say, but how are the dead raised, and with what body do they come? Now, writing to the Thessalonians, they were concerned because some of the believers had died before Jesus returned. And they had a misconception that because they had died before the Lord returned, they were going to miss out on the glorious kingdom age. And so Paul wrote to the Thessalonians and said, Now concerning those who are asleep in Christ, I write to you so that you don't sorrow as those who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus both died and rose again, then those who are asleep with Jesus will he bring with him at his coming. So here Paul refers to their coming. With what body do they come? When we meet our loved ones again, what kind of a body will they have? Paul said, thou foolish one, that which thou sowest is not made alive until it dies. He goes to nature. He goes to the planting of a seed into the ground. It doesn't come forth into new life until it first of all dies. The process is called germination. A seed germinates or dies. And then out of that seed, there comes the new body, the new life. And that which you sow, you don't sow the body that shall be. All you plant is a bare grain. You don't plant the full-blossomed carnation. All you plant is a bare seed. You don't plant the gladiola. All you plant is a bare bulb. It dies. But from that comes a new body. Comes the color, the beauty, the fragrance. It comes out of the death of the seed. You don't plant the body that's going to be. So I don't expect to have this body in heaven. This seed is going to be planted in the ground. It dies and is planted in the ground. And I don't expect to have this body in heaven. I expect to have a new body. A building of God not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. We'll get to that in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So, I think that that's an important point to make. You don't plant the body that's going to be. All you plant is a bare grain, and it might by chance be wheat or some other grain, and God gives to it a body as pleases him. What will my new body be like? I'm not sure, but it's going to please God, and it'll surely please me. It's got to be an improvement over this model. And so uh, I, I'm looking forward to it, uh, the new body that God has for me. Now, there will be, no doubt, some kind of relationship, uh, a mystic kind of a relationship, and, and just what I'm not sure. Um, there's a relationship between the gladiola bulb, the scaly brown thing that dies in the ground, and the beautiful pink blossom. There's a relationship. They're both gladiolas. And, and there's, a, there's some kind of a mystic tie between the two bodies, and yet the one is vastly more beautiful and superior to the seed. So there is some kind of a mystic relationship. I'm not completely sure. But it's not my problem. God's problem. <laughs> and, and there are those 
who, <laughs> you see, my body is changing all the time. Cells are dying and being replaced by other cells. And, and so there's this constant change that's going on in my body. And you have a problem also with modern technology and science where uh, people donate their organs. It, it sort of creates some, like the Sadducees came to Jesus and they said, you know, uh, there was a man who took a wife and he died without any children. And according to his law, the law, his brother took uh, him or took her as his wife and he died without any children and the next brother took her and the next brother and the next brother the next brother until all seven brothers had her as a wife they all died no kids so in heaven who will be her husband and Jesus said you do err because you don't know the scriptures of the power of God and and, and they were trying to uh, make the resurrection look sort of like a unreasonable thing. They were the Sadducees, and, and they were trying to put down the idea of the resurrection. There, there are those that have sought to put down the idea of the resurrection of the body because uh, they talk about the body is just made up of chemicals, uh, of, of you know, the dirt, the chemicals, so that the chemicals that make up my body now, uh, let us say that uh, uh, I would get lost out in the desert, uh, I would uh, die, no one would find me, uh, the uh, vultures would come and eat part of my body and the rest of it would dissolve into dirt and uh, the clump of grass would grow and the grass would actually uh, take some of the chemicals that were once a part of my body and uh, those chemicals would be into the grass eaten by a cow that came by that would produce milk uh, that would have some of these chemicals in the milk that someone else would drink so some of the chemicals that once made up my body would make up someone else's body so in the resurrection who gets the chemicals? Uh, <laughs> If you have a heart transplant in the resurrection, who gets the new heart, you know, or who gets the heart, and, or the lungs, or, or the body transplants. And so uh, they have uh, perceived problems uh, with the idea of the uh, literal resurrection of this body. Don't know. Uh, as I say, Paul would seem to indicate that yes, I'll still be me, but not the body. Me, the true me, is spirit. The true me isn't this body. This body is just an instrument that God has given to me by which I can express my spirit. The true me is spirit. And that remains. Paul would seem to indicate that he is going to give to me a new body. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we know that when this earthly tent, this body is dissolved, when it goes back to dust, we have a building of God, not a tent, a building of God, not made with hands, that is eternal in the heavens. So then, we who are in these bodies do often groan as we earnestly desire to be freed from the encumbrances of the body. Paul in Romans 8 said, For we and all of creation groan and travail together until now as we wait for the manifestation of the sons of God, to wit, the redemption of our bodies. Desire this new body, this building of God, not made with hands, eternal in the heavens and so we don't know all of the answers but we do know that God has a body for us vastly superior somehow mystically related to the body in which we presently live all flesh is not the same flesh there's the flesh of men 
another flesh of beast, another of fish, and another of birds. And the DNA uh, molecules that make up uh, flesh. Uh, that the flesh of man is different from the DNA of animals. Uh, the animals are different from the fowl. The fowl are different from the fish. There are various types of bodies, fleshly bodies. And then there are celestial bodies, heavenly bodies. And there are earthly bodies, bodies terrestrial or earthly bodies, heavenly bodies. The glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. The glory of the heavenly body differs from the glory of the earthly body. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon in, in the uh, stars and so forth. Uh, another, and one star differs from another star in glory. Greater stars, different colors, put them on the... Um, spectroscope and each star seems to have its own distinct color they differ from each other and so Paul said is the resurrection of the dead going back to the planting we are sown in dishonor or planted in dishonor but we are raised in glory we are sown in weakness but raised in power we are sown in a natural body, or we sow the natural body, but it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, again, Adam, coming back to this first and second. The first Adam was made a living soul. God formed the body out of the dust of the earth. The body was an Adam. God breathed into Adam and he became a living soul. So the first Adam was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. So the soul of man comes from Adam, but the spirit comes from Jesus Christ. Jesus said, you've got to be born again. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Don't marvel when I say, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you've got to be born again. This last Adam, Jesus, was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit, that was not first which was spiritual. Adam became, came before Jesus. But that which is natural, and afterward, that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth earthy. We've received our bodies from Adam. They are of the earth earthy. Made out of the earth, made for the earth. Dust thou art to dust thou shalt return, God said to Adam. Talking about the body, out of the earth, for the earth. Designed for the environmental conditions of the earth. The first man is of the earth earthy. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, this body, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. It doesn't yet appear what we're going to be, but we know with it, that when he shall appear, Jesus our Lord, we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Jesus resurrected body was vastly different and superior to the body that he was in while he was here on the earth. A body that was designed for a different dimension, a body that wasn't subject to uh, the laws of nature such as gravity uh, and uh, the new body uh, that Jesus, the resurrected body was different and so our resurrected bodies will be vastly superior and different. Now this I say, brethren, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. This old body just can't do it, can't make it. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. Now he's entering into another phase. 
we're not going to all sleep. Jesus is going to come one day and rapture his church. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the voice of the archangel, the trump of God. Dead in Christ shall rise first. We who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. But take that in context. Now concerning those that are asleep, I write to you as, so that you don't sorrow as those who have no hope. For those who are asleep in Christ will he bring with him at his coming. For we who are alive and remain to the coming of the Lord are not going to precede those that sleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the voice of the archangel, the trump of God. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the air to meet the Lord, and so shall we ever be with our Lord. Talking about the order of resurrection. Dead in Christ, rise first. And then we caught up together with them. So I'll show you a mystery. We're not going to all sleep. All of us won't die. But we shall all be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Again, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. In Revelation chapter 4, Paul, I mean John said, And after these things, I saw a door open in heaven, and the first voice was as of a trumpet saying unto me, Come up hither, I will show you things which will be after these things. So the trump of God, the church raptured at the last trump, here it declares. Now, we do know that after the rapture of the church during the great tribulation, during this great tribulation period, there are seven angels that are given trumpets that are to sound. And as they sound their trumpets, there are corresponding judgments of God that take place upon the earth. And when the seventh angel sounds his trumpet will be the final three of the last three woes. The last three trumpets bring woes. Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the three trumpets yet to sound. And there are those who say, well, the seventh trumpet is the last trumpet and thus the rapture won't take place until after the tribulation period. However, this trump of God is different from the trumpet of the angels. Notice the trump of God versus the seven angels which are given the trumpets to sound. Not only that, this happens in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. It's an instantaneous thing. And that seventh trumpet of Revelation, the judgment trumpet, and in the days of the sounding of the seventh trumpet, it's over a period of days. Plus, when this trumpet sounds, it's not going to be woe, it's going to be glory. Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the three trumpets yet to sound. And, and it will be a judgment trumpet, but this is going to be glory when the trump of God shall sound, the last trump, and we, the dead raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. A metamorphosis, a change of body. Why? Because flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom of God. Thus, this corruption must put on incorruption. This body is in a corrupting state. It, it's, the catabolic forces have taken their toll. And, and the body is gradually dying. This corruption must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality, the new body. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, 
Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Glorious. Death, the final foe. Jesus came to bring victory over death. Then shall be brought to pass the saying, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. That's what makes death, that's what causes death. Death in trespasses and sin. That's the sting of death. And the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Victory over death through him. Victory over sin. The sting of death is sin. He's given us victory over sin. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Stand firm. Be strong. The Lord's coming soon. Be strong. Be steadfast. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Involved in the things of the Lord. You know, so many of the things that we get involved in are temporal and are wasted time. People devote their entire lives to a project only to see the thing go down the tubes. And how frustrating that must be to give your whole life to a project and then watch the whole thing fall apart. Never happens if you give yourself to the work of the Lord. Because Paul said, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Whatever you do for Christ will be rewarded eternally. Lay not up for yourself treasures on earth, Jesus said, where moth and rust can corrupt and decay, where thieves can break through and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. For where your treasure is, there is your heart also. Always abounding in the work of the Lord, because whatever you do for Jesus is never in vain. Jesus said, if you'll give a cup of cold water in my name, you will be rewarded. Anything you do for Jesus, never in vain. How glorious it is to be able to give our lives to something that is lasting, something that is permanent, something that will remain. How fulfilling that is. How empty it is to give yourself over to projects that, that are going to pass, that are going to just dissipate have no lasting value. How fulfilling to give yourself to things that are eternal. Your labor for the Lord will never be in vain. Whatever you've done for Christ is not in vain. You'll be rewarded for it. You say, but I witnessed to 50 people, none of them accepted the Lord. Don't worry, you're not paid a commission. You're paid a salary. You don't have to close the deal. He only asks you to witness for him. And having witnessed, you've done all you can do. It's up to the Holy Spirit to take it from there. Your labor for the Lord is not in vain. How glorious. Thank you, Father, for the privilege of serving you and laboring for you. Thank you, Father, for the hope that we have through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That hope of coming into the kingdom of God in that new building of God, not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Dwelling with you, Lord, in the glories of your eternal kingdom, boggles our minds, stirs our imaginations beyond our comprehension. Oh Lord, how glorious to be with you. And Lord, we just pray that 
we might be steadfast. Against the assaults of the enemy, we, we stand strong, unmovable. And let us abound, Lord, in your work. In Jesus' name, amen. Shall we stand? I will serve you because I love you. You have given life to me. I was nothing until you found me. You have given life to me. Heartaches, broken people, ruined lives are why you died on Calvary. Your touch is what I long for. You have given I will serve you because I love you. You have given life to me. I was nothing until you found me. You have given life to me. Heartaches, broken people. Ruined lives are why you died on Calvary. Your touch is what I long for. You have given life to me. You have given life to me. God bless you.